Exactly. So yeah, so I remember when you said to me that you wanted to write a book mm. and we were talking about it and you said that the title was going to be An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West and that really struck me. What, what, why did you call it that? Well, first of all, in some ways the title is a bit of a compromise because I don't know if you saw the Sunday Time review, which was broadly positive. Yes, it was. One of the criticisms he made was, well, what is the West? Mm. And actually, if it were up to me, and it wasn't just about marketing as well, uh, I would have called it an immigrant's love letter to the Anglosphere because mm. that's really the, the, the countries that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about France. <laughs> yeah. Right. Not least because the French have a very different conception of freedom and where it comes from and, mm. and uh, you know the, the, the partly the, the consequence of the French Revolution is they obsess about reason and rationality whereas in the Anglosphere there's also an appreciation of tradition mm. as, as, a, as a source of wisdom and a source of knowledge so it should be called first of all an immigrant's love letter to the Anglosphere and actually one of the things that uh, I, one of the reasons I wanted to call it that was that it harkens back to Yuri Bezmenov who mm. you, I showed you some videos of, if you remember. Yes. Uh, which were very powerful. He was a KGB defector, mm. which talked about the way the Soviet Union was demoralizing uh, and dividing Western societies, particularly the American society. And he wrote a book called A Love Letter to America. Mm. So I wanted to reference that with the book. And th my book is very much making the point that he was making in his own time, which is... <sighs> you can mess around with all of the crap that you and I spend every week mm. discussing on trigonometry, all of this division and all this cultural bollocks and all of this sort of in, in navel gazing and obsessing about mm. internal stuff that doesn't really matter. You can do it as long as you don't have enemies, as long as you don't have people who are coming, as long as you don't have people who are willing to challenge that. And I've been saying to you, and you, uh, to be fair to you, you are coming from outside the West somewhat mm. and being uh, visiting uh, countries and uh, outside the West yourself, you you know this. N the rest of the world isn't like the West. No, <laughs> <laughs> to no. put it mildly, no. right? Uh, and the things that we want isn't necessarily what people in the West, I outside the West, want. And the methods of behavior that we mm. have here are not necessarily the methods of behavior that people have elsewhere. So if we continue mm. to obsess about things that don't matter, I mean, it, it strikes me as interesting that the last time you and I were sitting down like this and talking was the day after Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, these events are not disconnected. I mean, I said to someone, I, can't, I think it was Chris Williamson interviewed me for his uh, YouTube show. Don't plug rivals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, I, I was sort of saying, you know, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine wouldn't have happened or mm. certainly wouldn't have happened the way that it happened or when it happened if it hadn't been for the culture war. Mm. And that sounds like a bold claim and mm. people go, you're a culture warrior, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you think about it, Donald Trump failed to get reelected mm -hmm. because of the culture war in some way, right? You could, uh, you, there's no question about mm -hmm. that. Now, if Trump doesn't get reelected, we've had Putin's former advisor, Andrei Larionov, on the show saying, by the moment Biden got elected, this process started, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't a, a partisan point about Biden or Trump or whatever. My point is, what we do internally in the West affects how we are seen elsewhere mm -hmm. and it affects the consequence with the consequences consequences which we then suffer with which we are essentially inflicting on ourselves so my point is we've got to lay all this nonsense to bed and actually start to focus on very real problems i'm not just talking about the threat of russia or the, the, the struggle with china i mean look at what Economics is going to come back to the fore. You and I have both talked about mm -hmm. this, which is why one of the reasons we want, we're going to be getting more and more economists mm -hmm. back on the show. Interestingly, that's how trigonometry <laughs> started, of course. And that's because there's big problems and people aren't awake to what's going to happen. The, the rise in fuel prices, the rising food, pri the food prices, what we talk about is inflation. No one really gets what it's going to be like by the end of this year. I think people are starting to get it now. Yeah. What you have, I remember when Nigel Farage was actually sitting in that very seat, mm. and he said, and he, he actually said very similar words to use, which was, I don't think people understand what's going to happen mm. when those bills hit their mats in, I think it was in April or May yeah. or whenever it was. And he was talking about energy prices. He but, was indeed. But add to that fuel prices, mm -hmm. and now the, you've got a global food crisis going on. Food prices are going to go through the roof. You and I just interviewed only an hour ago Peter Zahan, who talked about all of this. 
So the economic future is going to be very challenging for a lot of people. We can't afford to be banging on about gender fluid lesbians being oppressed or whatever. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean? And that's kind of why I wanted to write the book. I wanted to remind people that what we have is great, what we have is valuable. We shouldn't throw it out just because some race activists want to complain about, you know, air conditioning and off or whatever it is that they're banging on about. We've got to lay those issues to rest and we've got to move on and talk about the serious stuff that actually makes a difference to everyone's life. But don't you think the fact that we're obsessing over, the, over these trivial mundane issues, like we went to visit your family in Armenia mm. and I remember sitting down with them yeah. and they went, well, what are people talking about in the West? Right. And I said, well, one of the big issues actually uh, is uh, what is a woman? Yeah. And she just looked at me <laughs> like I had lost my nut. No, what? <laughs> well, I, I was loving you explaining it because my whole family were just sitting there going, what? No, yeah. it is not possible. What? <laughs> it is not possible. What? It is not. You know, just cause the and they were all women as well. Which right, made... right. But, but the point is, like, it, none of the shit is worth talking about. None of it makes sense. But yeah. we've got to a position where we're having to address GCC biology before we can actually talk about the stuff that really matters. And that's a problem, Francis. If the prime minister of this country is being asked what a woman is instead of what his policy is or her policy is on, you know, dealing with the cost of living crisis or the housing crisis or all, all of these other real problems, they're naturally going to spend their time talking about that and less time thinking and worrying and fixing the problems that we've actually got. I mean, look at the leadership race now. You know, you and I, for example, both quite like Kemi Badenoch mm -hmm. because she's good on cultural issues. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't want the next prime minister of this country to be good to, to be able to define a woman. Mm -hmm. I've got higher ambitions. Mm. Look, I completely agree. But doesn't it show that there's something quite rotten at the core of our society? And the one thing that maybe is, is, is perhaps the truth about this is the reason we've been able to focus so much on these trivialities is our lives have been great. Mm. Now, it is my fear and suspicion that that may not be the way that it has been in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think we're all going to get a lot poorer. Mm -hmm. Our lives are going to get more difficult. I think the stability and, and prosperity we've enjoyed is genuinely under threat. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen you know, some of the interviews we've already recorded but haven't yet put out. You know, the end of globalization, it has some benefits, of course, but in the short term, it's going to be very painful for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that will be one of the things that does away with the culture war somewhat, is it forces people to focus on things that matter. And what are the things that matter? Well, I think at the moment it, it's very clear what matters. One is international security. Mm -hmm. That's been thrown completely uh, in the air by what Russia is doing in Ukraine and some of the other moves that are happening. We don't mm -hmm. know exactly what they'll look like. And the other thing, of course, is economics. I mean. People are going to starve around the world from the mm. famine that's coming. Uh, we're fortunate in the West to probably be spared that, but you're seeing uh, various things that are happening around that, whether it's in Holland, whether it's in Sri Lanka, mm. wherever you want. And the, the other thing, of course, is the cost of living is going to go up massively. And when that happens, you know, we think about it as like, oh, well, we can't afford as many avocados or whatever, or as many meals out. For a lot of people, it's the, the choice between heating and eating or whatever mm. it is. And that's a genuine fact. You know, there are a lot of people, pensioners, for example, in this country. Now, I know they all voted Brexit, so they <laughs> deserve to die, according <laughs> to some people. But in reality, I mean, they're some of the most vulnerable people in society, not least because they're not able to control their income. They can't mm. go and get a second job or a third job or whatever to mm. supplement their income. They're going to be in a lot of trouble. And how we deal with that is much more important to me than, you know, Dr. Sholo and Good Morning Britain banging on about how someone's offended her. You know what I mean? No, I, look, I completely agree with you. And the really interesting thing about your book is that it, it it's doing very, it hasn't even been released yet, mm -hmm. and it's doing very well on pre-sales. Like, the reviews have been great. It's already been, uh, it's already gone for a reprint. It's already had a reprint. It's yeah. already had a reprint. So why is that? Well, for, before I answer that, I should say just how incredibly grateful I am mm. to, and this is mostly our fans. To me. Yeah, to, I'm very <laughs> grateful to you, mate. Uh, but I, I am so grateful mm. that, 
you know, people have the trust that I'm going to put out that's something worth reading. My first book, no reason people should think that I'd be some great author, but I feel like I've written a book that's worth reading, mm. particularly given some of the historical context that I give that people may mm. be unfamiliar with about my own family, the history of the Soviet Union. I think even from a just, if you're interested in history, it's, it's, mm. it's hopefully a, a good book to read. Um, but to answer your question, you know, like you say, thousands of copies sold before it's even released. Uh, just in the UK alone and more in America and elsewhere. I think people realize that we've got a problem, man. I mm. think people realize that this lack of confidence in ourselves, this lack of gratitude for what we have, it, it's going to cause real problems and it already has. And I think some of the divisiveness we see in society is because we don't feel like we're pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you think about even the word debate, we talk about, well, the importance of debate, right? But would you say that what happens on a morning TV channel that I've been on and I've done those debates, mm. is that really a debate? Is that two people trying to arrive at a conclusion by testing each other's ideas? Mm. Not really. You know, those are two enemies fighting and trying to win. To me, a debate is more like what me, you and Anton have around the mm. studio when we're talking about sometimes quite difficult subjects. Mm. And, you know, you put an idea forward and I put the opposite idea forward and Anton's got his own idea. And we sit around and we talk and then eventually we either come to an understanding or we agree to disagree mm. or whatever. But that's a debate. And the reason that works is we're all pulling in the same direction. Mm. But if we've got to a point as a society where we feel so disconnected from each other that our fellow citizens are our enemy, mm. that we don't want to get to a common understanding. What we want is to destroy them. What we want is to humiliate them. What we want them is for them to lose. That's not a recipe for a healthy society. And most importantly, it's not a recipe for a society that's going to be able to defend itself or project its power internationally, which is what we have to do. Mm. And obviously social media has been, a, when it comes to this particular issue, you're more yeah. positive than social Follow media. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're more positive than social, me uh, than social media than I am. I I'm a lot more negative about it. But, I mean, that's been a disaster for debate, surely. It, it, look, the re you say I'm more positive than you. I think I'm just more realistic than you, which is that it's not going away. Right? Yeah. It's not going away. You hesitate to say yet yeah to that because you'd, you'd like to smash. You, but see, there, is not, no, there isn't a place you could go with a hammer and break it all down anymore. No. Yeah, it's sure. not going to happen. Yeah. Right? So we have social media. Mm. And it's up to us to learn to use it. I think mm. we will eventually. I think there will be regulations and rules in place that allow it to be mm. a place that's healthier. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that, you know, depending on who gets elected, that may be more restrictive or less restrictive. And of course, you and I but have tremendous concerns about the regulation, but we also think some regulation will have to come in to deal with it, right? Um, social media hasn't been great in some ways, but on the other hand, look at what we do. We, we give people an opportunity to listen to somebody talk, mm -hmm. and w I hope that what we do on trigonometry is facilitating genuine discussion, and we wouldn't be where we are without social media, without all these technologies. So I really think it's about how we learning to use it properly, Hmm. Uh, and I, I think that we will eventually get to a position where we're able to do that as a society. Like I say, it will require the tech companies to modify things, it will require regulation, it will require self-restraint too. I mean, the way I use social media has changed in, in the last couple of years. I used to just you, you love trolling people on it and pissing. That doesn't sound like you, mate. <laughs> but actually, if you look at my Twitter now, I, I really don't tend to do that anymore. Yeah. It's quite rare for me because I'm trying to be a bit more sensible, a bit more responsible. Uh, with the way that I use it. And I think a lot of people are feeling that way, actually. Mm. So I think a lot of the solutions will come from people themselves taking responsibility for their actions. Yeah, I do know what you mean. The, the, the part of social media that I just makes me deeply uncomfortable, and it's this knowledge that our brains are being hacked. Mm. We're shown the most outrageous content because that's the thing that we're going to engage with because it stirs our emotions. Mm. And if you feel angry about something, then you're going to want to do something mm. about it. You're going to be, you know, you're going to get into an argument, and you're going to spend more time on the platform, and we we all know how it goes. Mm. Do you not worry about that? Of course I do. Uh, all I'm saying is it's not going away. Yeah. It's like tr you know th when when the printing press was invented and, mm. and all these publications came out again, people who had be mostly illiterate didn't have a chance to read anything like that, and it caused you know 150 years of religious war and conflict. Uh, so that may happen. Yeah. No. <laughs> Well, good to be positive, yeah. right? But you know what I'm saying? is like yeah. th the only thing that I can do about that 
is be responsible with what I do and advocate for policies which I think will mitigate some of those disruptive factors. That's all either of us can do, and, and I'm trying to do my best, and I think you are as well. Uh, and we've got a great interview with Jaron Lanier coming out about that. Yeah, absolutely, and that was a thrill. The, the, one of the fathers of virtual reality mm. to talk to him about you know, the, the way the internet started, the utopian ideals it had, and now where it's ended up. It's yeah. a brilliant interview. Plus a white man with dreadlocks. Exactly. Can't go wrong. Yeah, exactly. Definitely a vegan. Oh, we don't know that. He might not be. He lives in California, mate. Of course Definitely a vegan. a vegan. But looking at your book and reading your book, there's an affinity between us in that mm. I think it's because the reason we, we, we see the way the world, the way we see it, in particular the West, it's because we've seen something else. Whereas I think part of the problem is, is that if you're born into this mm. system, well, this is just normal, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you think it's never going to change, you take it for granted. I, I absolutely agree with you, and that's why I wrote the book, because I'm trying to give, you know, I really, you know, I think there'll be people, of course, who see me as, you know, this culture warrior and mm. blah, 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 blah. But actually, I've written the book in a way that I hope will be really easy for people who normally might disagree with me to read mm. because I want them to see the West through a foreigner's eyes mm. and understand what in Russia we have a saying, uh, everything is understood in comparison. Mm -hmm. If you think the West, let's say Britain in particular, these racist, evil countries, the question I always want to ask is compared to what? Mm. This is one of Thomas Sowell's great questions for dealing with progressive thinking. Mm. Compared to what, at what cost, and I can't remember the third one now, mm -hmm. right? But compared to what is a crucial thing. If you're comparing it to some utopia, maybe you could argue the West isn't as good as it could be. But if you're comparing it to every other human society that's ever existed, we're actually doing really well. Mm. And that's what I wanted to get across to people. I, and you know, as you know, probably the most controversial chapter in the book is about slavery. And I make the point in every interview that I've done that you know a lot of people are running around saying, oh, we talk about it too much and whatever. I actually think, and I'm sure you'll agree with me as a former teacher, we don't teach enough about slavery, but what we do teach is only one tiny aspect of it, which mm -hmm. is the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. But if you put that in the broader context of the human experience, most people don't know that human beings were the first good that was ever traded, right? Slavery has been with us since the beginning of time. And the only thing that makes the Western attitude to slavery unique, really, I mean, there was a few things that were to do with technology, the ability to, to transport mm. large numbers of people across an ocean, although the trans uh, Saharan slave trade was doing that across Africa, not on ships, but on land. But it was really the fact that we ended it. The mm. West ended slavery, even when it was happening in Russia, when it was happening in Africa, when it was happening in the Middle East, when it was happening everywhere. The colonial powers, actually spent an awful lot of energy and money and time ending it. And the trans-Saharan slave trade, which had a higher death rate, which had more slaves involved in it, it only ended because the West came in and, and basically made it stop, mm. right? So we, yes, we must understand the terrible periods in our history when we've done the wrong thing or did things that we now regret. But it has to be seen as a part of a bigger context. And I think that's really important to get across to people, which is why I use the example of my grandfather, who was taken to Germany as a slave mm. laborer during World War II, or my great grandfather, who was kept in a gulag because he was useful. He was a slave. Mm. Like, this isn't, this isn't as simple an issue as Dr. Schola screaming about it. Do you see what mm. I'm saying? Yeah. And also, as well, it doesn't take into account that there's more slaves than ever at the moment. Modern day slavery. Right. But we don't seem to want to address that or There's talk about it. There's not many careers to be built on talking about that. That's the problem. Yeah. And I think that is part of the problem. But it, one of the things that I've noticed in the West more and more, and maybe it's just become a, I've become more aware of it or it's become more prevalent. I'm not sure which is which. It's just the self-flagellation, mm. this constant apologising, which is also, it's not just the fact that people in the West do it. It's if you're Western, middle class and white, and all mm. of a sudden... It seems for large swathes of these people, they go around apologising for things that happened hundreds of years before they were born. Mm. Doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. But what I think has happened there is, I talked about this in my first interview with John Anderson. I think it's weaponized empathy. Uh, I think people have worked out that people in the West, particularly people who are comfortable, mm. who, who grew up with genuine advantages in life, like money and an opportunity to go to a good school and two parents and all of these things, mm they feel guilty 
uh, they've been made to feel guilty because probably they don't have many that many struggles in their life on, on the sort of historical perspective scale. Mm. Uh, and so th they they need something to, to, to sort of invest themselves emotionally into. Mm. And there are some people who've worked that out, these activists have worked mm. that out, and they're pushing this agenda knowing that it's gonna, they're gonna persuade people. And mm. that's why you've got Gary Lineker, who clearly doesn't know a thing about a thing, doesn't know anything about anything mm. except football, uh, banging on about this stuff constantly. And because he gets the likes and the dopamine hits and the whatever. Right? That's why it's happening, because mm. it's weaponized empathy and then it's rewarded. Mm. If you go around self-flagellating, people are going to pat you on the back and say, oh, well done. Right? Whereas if you say, actually, I'm not responsible for something that people did 300 years ago, you're automatically a bigot, you're racist mm. and all of this other stuff. So that's disincentivized. Mm. But if you think about it, if you just pause for a second, just take stock of what we're talking about. I, I use this in the book. Even in the Torah, the, one of the oldest scriptures, which is no, by no means progressive, no. let me tell you. Right? I'm sure it's got a few problematic passages yeah. in it. It's probably a bit transphobic. It talks about how children must not be punished for the sins of their fathers, mm. and fathers must not be punished for the sins of their children. Mm. We, we have gone backwards so far, mm. we are now in pre, prehistoric times in terms of our attitudes to things. Mm. We're literally trying to hold people accountable for something relatives of theirs did that they never even met. Mm. And in most cases, they aren't even relatives, Francis. Mm. They are people who just happen to have the same skin color. Not even, by the way, the same ethnicity like you, mm. right? You are descended from Irish and Venezuelan people, mm. right? I don't think you, you, your ancestors would have been that heavily involved in the slave trade, yet someone would look at you and go, well, you're responsible, you need to apologize and mm. you need to pay reparations. It, this is an ass-backward idea that is millenn people millennia, like when they were just herding sheep, mm. they knew this was wrong. Mm. And we're doing now in the modern world. It seems to me that, and it's one of the things that we're doing in, 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 in one of the things that you talked about in your book, that you put it more eloquently than me, it seems like we've got, the West is this block of Jenga. You know the game Jenga? Yeah. And we just seem to be pulling out pieces right. randomly without even considering why the piece is there or actually what it's upholding. That's a great metaphor. And that's exactly how I feel. That you've put, mate, I didn't, need, I didn't need the book, just that, that little <laughs> metaphor is good. But that's it. That's it. And you know, one of the things I talk about, uh, right, as you know, at the very, very, very end, it's literally the last passage of the book, <laughs> is uh, my grandmother, who was born in a concentration in the Gulag, mm. um, and when her parents were eventually released, uh, anyone who was a prisoner in the Gulag was mm. not allowed to live in the major cities of the mm. Soviet Union. Uh, they, they had to live in the periphery, mm. in the small towns far away from the center. And the only people that lived in these remote towns were people who'd been in the gulags as mm. prisoners, mm. people who'd been in the gulags as camp guards, mm. and the local native population who were very small. Mm. So basically you had, let's say, a town of 10,000 people, mm. and most of the people there would have been former prisoners in the mm. gulag, and a lot of the other people were guards in the gulag, mm. right? And my gra grandmother's family lived in the same landing as a family who, where the man had been a guard in one of these camps. And when Stalin died, there was a big revelation. The, mm. the, the Khrushchev exposed the cult of personality. Mm. They condemned all the atrocities and the excesses. They said it was not the party wishes, it was Stalin himself mm. and whatever. And they basically apologized and exposed what had been happening. Mm. And a lot of these men in, in, who had been guards in the camps they ended up shooting themselves mm. because they so believed in this ideology. Mm. They so believed that they, they, are, they can demonize people that they disagree with, that, they, oh, they must be in the camp for a good reason, right? We are, we're justified mm. to condemn these people. We're justified to treat them like they're second-class citizens, to talk down to them, to call them names, to bully them. We're justified in all of this because we have the right ideology. Mm. And this is kind of my invitation to people who are maybe not naturally aligned with some of the stuff that you and I talk about is don't be one of those people. Don't be one of these useful idiots who goes along with treating people badly because you believe you have the right ideology. You're not a good person if you're sending J.K. Rowling death threats. Mm. You're not. 
You're not a good person if you're demonizing people who voted in a referendum in a different way to you. You're not doing good. You're not helping. You're making things worse. And likewise, by the way, on the right, it's the same. You know, every time you genuinely attack people or, or to dehumanize people who are of a different point of view to you, mm. you're not helping. Now, you and I will joke and we're comedians mm. and we will satirize and mock and whatever, and that's all fine, mm. you know. But I think that there's lines that we don't want to cross in, in, the, in the name of ideology. And, and it worries me that here in the West, we're, we're doing that a lot. And the example I give, you know, um, the Americans obviously were the first to develop a nuclear bomb. Mm. And the Soviets were nowhere near. Mm. Do you know how they got one? No. There were two, um, particularly, uh, there were two very big names. I, I think Klaus Fuchs is one of his names, and there was another one. Who, uh, two people who were involved in the Manhattan Project in the mm. United States who were sympathetic to the communist cause. Mm. And they basically gave Stalin, the Soviet Union, the nuclear bomb because they were ideologically supportive of the regime. That's what, that's what ideology will do to people. That's why one of the opening bits of the book is I talk about how living in the Soviet Union taught me never to buy into someone mm. else's ideology because it will make you always, always make you violate your own principles um, and make you do bad things. This is actually what I found interesting about Douglas Murray's review mm. in The Telegraph, which he was very generous with. He quoted that line because I think that's true. And that's why, you know, when we talk about the direction of the show, we've all, we never wanted to be on the right or on the left. Mm. We're, we're trying to explore each issue on its merits mm. and not be ideological because ideology will always blind you, whatever that ideology mm. is, whether it's progressivism or conservatism or liberalism or libertarianism or feminism or, or whatever area you have where you're looking at things ideologically instead of on the basis of the facts, you're going to find yourself doing things you don't agree with later in life. And that's why I try and stay away from it. And it's also as well, it, it strikes me, look, look, it's all people who follow a particular ideology. When you're, you're so certain about something, 100% mm. certain, mm. It's a dangerous place to be. Mm. You should always have room for doubt. Mm. You should always have room for doubt because we're all fallible. We're all human. We're all flawed. Mm. None of us is perfect. None of us is all seeing. None of us is all knowing. And that's a problem for me with a lot of the ideology that you criticize is that phrase, you, we're on the right side of history. Mm. And my own response is, how do you know? Yeah. How do you know? How do you know about people 200 years are going to view you? Mm. What, you know, if you look at the way we look at people 200 years ago, it's not favorable. Mm. So what makes you think you're any better? Mm. I agree. I agree. I, and I think uh, that's why you've always got to be careful. Uh, because This is why I think it's really important to constantly be checking with yourself about your actions. And it's, I'm not saying my actions are always perfect, by the mm. way. And, but I am constantly doing this and going, are my actions the actions of a person that I, I like and respect. Mm. Because it doesn't matter what your ideology is. You can believe in, in progress and equality and all of this stuff. But it, as you and I know from the comedy industry, there are lots of people who believe that and, and bang on about it while groping women in the green room, mm. right? Um, and it's the same with almost anything. It's like, if, like I say, if you're, if you're a hateful person, I don't care what your ideology is. I don't care how accurate it is. You're mm. a hateful person. Right. And that's my worry with ideology. That's how you can excuse yourself for being a nasty person or a hateful mm. person or a, a person that attacks people. Or as in the case of our former guest, James Cavarini, you know, he, he has a fundraiser with Jake Rowling and people are now smashing in windows mm. in, in his restaurant or writing one star reviews or whatever. You know, you've got to check in with yourself and go, this isn't right. Mm. Why am I doing this? Why am I attacking people? Why am I trying to smear people? Why am I destroying people's careers? Now, as I say, again, you and I mock people that we disagree with. Mm. We mock stupid ideas and we will always continue to do that. But I, I'd like to think we've never gone after anyone's career. We've no. never tried to destroy their livelihood or anything like that. Mm. Because I think that's really when you know that you've got to the wrong place. And, and part of the problem as well with this ideology and, and all ideologies is that it's a really easy way for people to mask who they truly are. 
where they go, oh, I'm this progressive liberal. And it's a fantastic cloak mm. for this behavior that is despicable and mm. vile and wrong. Mm. And we've seen it time after time. Mm. Like we joke about it in our own industry in comedy. Well, former or if you're a former <laughs> industry in comedy, we always said it's always the wokest comedians that the biggest perverts. Mm. Because what a fantastic way yeah. to cloak yourself yeah. then by pretending to be virtuous. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why I think it's really important not to buy into any ideology and to think to think those things through. But I also think, you know, I wanted to write the book because I want to lay these issues to rest. Mm. So that, like we said at the very beginning, we can focus on the things that matter. I think that's really important. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we talk about certain issues that that are people would consider progressive, mm. but not as much as we used to, because mm. I, I think we'll continue, obviously, to call out things that are wrong on both right and left. But as I say, I think we've got a lot of bigger fish to fry at the moment in society, and we've got to focus on that. And I think people are waking up to that, yeah. slowly but surely. You know, it's all very well screaming at Twitter that somebody has mis you know, not used the correct pronoun, etc. But if you can't afford to fill your car up, does it really matter? Exactly. <sighs> So that being the case, looking back at the Soviet Union and living in that, mm. what was it like growing up in that country, in that system? Well, this is one of the reasons that I think the book is so relevant now. I mean, my grandfather, uh, so I've mentioned about five grandfathers yeah. at this point, and they're all different ones. My mm. grandfather, who uh, lived in the UK, mm. who moved to the UK, the reason he ended up in the UK is that he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Mm. And when he did this, he was made unemployable, mm. ostracized by many of his friends, yeah. and eventually was forced to leave the country and find a new job. How unfamiliar is that to the 21st century Western countries? Someone expressing the wrong opinion, being made unemployable and ostracized by the, their friendship circle. Not that unfamiliar, right? No. So I'm afraid we are, we are adopting some of the worst elements of that society. Uh, and th there will be other parallels when people read the book and, and read about some of the things that used to happen. I think it will open their eyes because to most people, they think that what's happening in the West now is new and unprecedented and blah, 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 blah. But it, it's really not. Even if you look at, you know, I know many of our audience will know this because I've talked about this before, but for those who don't, political correctness mm. isn't something that happened in the 1990s and pissed off Richard Littlejohn and, mm. and Kel Kelvin McKenzie and other tabloid editors. Kel political correctness comes from the Soviet Union. I, I have a whole chapter in the book about uh, speech and how it's being misused now and, and, and the way that words are being changed. And political correctness was a way of preventing people from expressing an opinion that was counter to the party line. Mm. Does that sound unfamiliar? Not really. So this is my point. We are adopting some of the worst elements of the very societies that we spent decades trying to defeat. Mm. But it wasn't like all societies. There was a lot of negatives with the Soviet yeah. Union. But there's also some positives oh, as well. Well, well I, I, again, I talk about, there's a whole chapter in the book about this, and it was, it was my first ever article that I wrote. Uh, it was called Growing Up in a Progressive Utopia. It was on mm. Quillette. And I talk about the wealth, uh, how little wealth inequality there was, the fact that there was universal health care, mm -hmm. education was free, and in fact, university students were paid to study and all of this stuff. But the cost of it, in my opinion, wasn't worth it. And, and, and I detail the cost of it in the book. Yeah, and the, the little things that I just found fascinating where if, you know, well, you didn't have a choice about what your career was. No, no, no. You, you went to, to, to university. You may get a choice as to what to study. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there on, you were assigned the job and you would go wherever you were sent. And that was it. And, uh, what, and what happened if you went, well, actually, you know what? I don't want to be a biochemist. I always really wanted to be a school teacher. Uh, I, I, look, at different stages, it would have been different. It would have been de dependent mm. on the bribes you could pay, on the connections you had. It mm. was all sort of based on yeah. that. But generally speaking, you, you would get a job assigned to you and you would go and do that job. Do you know the one, one of the things that I found so interesting is when you talked to me about service culture in the mm. Soviet Union mm. and how the way and how in, in ex-Soviet countries, 
the service is always atrocious. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I this is how you know a Chinese restaurant is actually authentic, is if you get shared service. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, the reason that even now, when you go to that part of the world, the service might not be great in some places, it's changing now because the people who, who are like that are sort of dying out or at least not working in restaurants. It's usually younger people. But the reason it was unfriendly and hostile was that the waiter was the one who had the power. Mm -hmm because they could give you a plate of food that had a lot of meat on it mm -hmm. or not much meat on it, and you couldn't really do anything about it. So they were the ones that were in charge. It was the same with people who would sell something to you in a shop. Mm. They could afford, they could get bribes of people to get the right goods and stuff like that because everything was scarce, and therefore they had the power over the distribution of it. So in many ways, it just incentivized corruption. Of course it did, yeah. Of course it did, which is one of the reasons Russia remains so corrupt today. And, and all post-Soviet countries, really, particularly it, other than the Baltics, where the problem is, is, is lessened because they were never really fully part of the Soviet Union that long. You know, and the last time we were here, we were talking about Putin and we were talking mm. about the invasion. And you saw that coming. Why? Well, especially what was it? Was it the background? Was it seeing the way the West was going. What was it that made you, or that gave you that particular insight? Well, after 2014, mm. it was clear that Putin was gonna carry on with what he was doing because there was no pushback from the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I think after 2020 and Biden's election, it was clear that this was going to be an opportunity. And I think also, like I said, seeing the, how divided uh, Western society was. I actually think in some ways Putin perhaps made the same miscalculation that I made, mm. which is I overestimated how uh, divided we are. Mm. I thought we're more divided and the response would be less strong. Uh, the response has actually been quite unified other than Germany mm. from Western countries. So I think it was those three things really. Mm. The, the fact that the United States was taking its eye off the ball with the, all of the election stuff that was happening there, the fact that the West was being perceived, with Russian help, by the way, mm. of being very divided and unwilling to assert itself, and the fact that Putin already took a piece of Ukraine in 2014 and mm. there wasn't really much pushback. So going back and focusing on the things that are happening and the, and the issues that we're talking about, mm. the big issue is, of course, and we've touched on it before, what is a woman? And what we saw, and what we've seen recently, is this al alliance between conservatives mm. and gender critical feminists. Yeah, that was never going to last, <laughs> was it? <laughs> no, no, absolutely yeah. not. And it's starting to break apart, or certainly for at the edges. No, I think it is breaking apart. Yeah. You see now J.K. Rowling having spats with Matt Walsh and all of this. Of course it's breaking apart. I think one of the reasons, actually, is that I think the gender critical feminists feel that they're winning. Mm. You know, you've got the Maya Four starter, the Kira Bell, the, the, you know, you've got candidates now who are talking about this for running for leadership of the Tory party. Mm -hmm. You're seeing other changes happening. Uh, and I think they sort of think they don't need the conservatives anymore. And that's maybe one of the reasons that they're uh, willing to be a bit more confrontational about it. But the other thing is very interesting. We obviously just recorded an interview with Louise Perry, who mm. I was very impressed by, yep. who is a feminist, who's written a book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And one of the things that you probably noticed that we were, she was sort of talking about chivalry and, mm. you know, not actual equality and stuff like that. And I think, you know, this is probably going to annoy some people, including in our audience, but it does need to be said, like, the problem with feminism is feminists never wanted equality. They talked about it, but that's not what they wanted. Mm. And I don't blame them for it, by the way. I don't think equality in that very narrow sense is necessarily what the right solution is. But it was like, I mean, I'll prove it to you. No feminist wants equality. Because think about this, right? If you, you and I are friends and we like each other, but mm -hmm. let's imagine that we didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, you came over here and spat in my face, yeah. right? The chances are I would hit you. Mm -hmm. That is the code between men. We all know it. We all approve of it. It's fine. It's the way it's always worked. Blah, 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 mm. blah, right? There's not a feminist in the world who says that if you were a woman mm. and you came over, came over here and spat in my face, mm. I should punch you. Mm. There's no one who's going to defend that. If a feminist is asked about that, they'll say, well, male violence, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. And, you know, and basically, they want you and me to become a little bit more like them, mm -hmm. right? 
And what the smart feminists are starting to realize, actually the sexual revolution has been really bad for both sexes, but especially for women, mm -hmm. especially for women. And I think that's part of the other reason that this alliance is fraying or breaking apart, because now that I think the gender critical feminists feel like they're making progress, mm -hmm. they're like, oh shit, these guys that we've been aligned with, they're not on our team, which they're not, by the way, they're mm -hmm. absolutely not. And also, they're starting to realize that equality wasn't really all it was made out to be. No. You know, and that's probably going to be the next conversation that we'll have as a society, because I've always, you know, the, feminism is, is a weird word because it means all things to all women, mm. right? There's about 53 different ways of doing feminism, mm. some of which I really agree with and I mm. think are great, and some of which I think are damaging and destructive and quite pointless and just people who are angry at the dad. Um, and we're going to have to work out a path through that mm. as a society because driving men and women apart, which some feminists have tried to do, I'm not sure that's a good outcome for society either. So, as I say, the smart feminists are starting to realize that actually we're going to have to change the conversation a little bit. And I think that will be one of the next things that we uh, talk about on the show uh, in a big way, I suspect. Yeah, and it's also the role of the family. Mm. You sometimes wonder that you see all these people having these pointless conversations on Twitter. No one's really having kids anymore. And you think, well... I am. Yeah, you are. Mate, when are you <laughs> going to get started? Let's get Poon Poon in here. I don't know, it's when, when Anton and I get a surrogate, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you've t we've talked with Louise Perry about how bad that is. Yeah. How immoral and unethical that is. And I agree with it, by the way. It is, absolutely it is. But you do think, would people be having these pointless conversations if they had a family? Right. If they were able to settle down, if things weren't the way they were. Now, look. You know, you can always say, you know, you can blame a variety of external factors mm. and ultimately your life is in your hands. And yes, I agree with that. But the reality is it's becoming more and more difficult for people to start a family. Yeah. And it's creating a wealth of problems mm. that we're seeing right the way through society. Well, that's why I have a whole chapter in the book about the housing crisis. Yeah. It's not just a book about how the woke are idiots because I, I don't think there's any value in that. I'm trying to talk about how we get to a better society and, mm. and fixing the housing crisis is going to be one of the main ways of doing that in this country. It's essential. And this is what really pisses me off about Michael Gove, is when he talks about woke people. And I'm like, you're a housing minister, mate. You want people to be conservative, yet you're not incentivizing them to, have, to be conservative because they've got nothing to conserve. They've got no assets. So I think, you can shut your mouth. N not that I am a big fan of Michael Gove, but I think the problem extends slightly beyond him. <laughs> we've seen, you know, we've, we're not doing what we need to be doing for decades on that issue now. But he's done very little to resolve it. Admittedly, uh, like everybody else, in yeah. my opinion. But, and, and, so, and so the point is, it's that I think what we talk about a lot on the show and what you talked about in your book is, you know, going back to that metaphor, you know, of Jenga, of pulling things apart. But isn't the problem that there's these people, there's a lot of people of our generation and younger who feel they've got nothing invested in society? Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I do also think, as you know, you know, I've always been someone who was very interested in personal development mm. and making the most of my life and growing as a person. I do think the circumstances are, are more difficult than they've been in the past. And I also think they're going to get even more difficult. But I also think that's a, a reason for people of our generation and younger to work harder, to be more creative, to mm. be smarter. You know, we can all sit here and complain about the state of the world. If you, I know one thing, if there's one thing I know is if you want your life to be better, you're going to have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about the West, isn't it, really? You, that's the thing about the West is almost everywhere else you have to have family, connections, blah, 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 blah. In the West, if you're smart, if you're talented, if you're driven, if you're creative, you will make it. And that's always my message to people, uh, especially young people. Young people do not hear that enough, man. Mm. I didn't hear it as a young person enough. You live in a society in which you can make it. You mm. can make something of yourself. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm, uh, I love living in Britain, as you know, but I am also very uh, inspired by some of the American ways of thinking as well, because that go get it attitude to me is inspiring. I mm. think it's really important. Uh, and I've tried to have that as part of our ethos here on the show. You know, we've mm. made a lot of ourselves from a very low start, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say. And I think partly is that you and I both have 
and Anton as well have that attitude. Like, we want to get better. Mm -hmm. We want to make the show as good as possible. I want to write a book. You're going on a stand-up tour. We're doing live shows. Like, we want to do stuff. Mm -hmm. We want to create stuff. And I, that's always the message I have for young people. You know, we talk about incels and all these people. Like, no one's going to give it to you, man. Mm -hmm. You've got to go out and you've got to work for it. And that's so, I hear you on the housing crisis. I know it's a big problem. I have a whole chapter in the book. But also, everybody's just, you're going to have to step up if you want something. Yeah. You just and, are. And this is a problem, is that we've been incentivized to play victim. Yeah. And I am saying in the book, it's not good for you. Don't be a victim. You're not a victim. Everyone's a victim and no one's a victim. It's not helpful, especially if you're a victim, to think of yourself as a victim. It's really not going to make your life better. It's just going to make it worse. So instead of that, focus on the positives. What can you do? What can you create? What can you make that's of value to other people? If you do that in this society, unlike most others, you will succeed. And I think that is a great point to pause it. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect your super chats, your PayPal, send them through, and then I will look through them during the break with my glamorous assistant, Anton, and we are going to put your questions to Constantine. So, Send through your PayPal's, send through your super chats, and during this very short uh, commercial break, makes it sound, sound professional, doesn't it? We're going to collate them and we're going to put them to Constantine. Thank you so much for watching, guys. We'll be back after these very short adverts. See you soon. Hey, Constantine, do you love trigonometry? I'm from Russia. I cannot love anything apart from vodka, miserable literature, and the horrendous downfall of my people. But yes, I find trigonometry satisfactory. And do you like live shows? Of course, but only if it's Chekhov play about collapse of Russian aristocracy as they face death and obscurity before the glorious might of the proletariat and the beautiful revolution. Okay, mate. Well, if you like trigonometry live shows, then get your credit card out for the lads because we're coming to the Edinburgh Festival this August. We have only booked two shows, August 6th and 7th, because if we do more, the comedy industry will treat us like the czars and execute us. That's right. We're going to be in Edinburgh for two days only. Saturday's guest is Andrew Doyle, which is sure to sell out. Our other guest is Leo Kurse, which means when Nicola Sturgeon hears about it, she'll ban us from Scotland herself. Tickets are sure to sell out, and when they're gone, they're gone. Click on the link below and we'll see you in Edinburgh on the 6th and 7th of August at the Gilded Balloon Teviot. Come and see us before hordes of left-wing comedians try to put us in gulag. We hope you're enjoying this incredible interview. Did you know that you can ask guests your questions? That's right. When you join our Locals community, not only will you know who we're about to interview, you have the opportunity to ask them your questions. You have the chance to ask Jordan Peterson, the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, Nigel Farage, Douglas Murray, Andrew Doyle, Jeff Norcott, Simon Evans, Larry Elder, David Badil, Andrew Sullivan, Megan Kelly, Julia Hartley Brewer, Lord Nigel Lawson, Brett Weinstein, Inaya Falarin Iman, Dr. David Nutt, Jimmy Dore, Gad Sad, Blair White, Melissa Chen, Trevor Phillips, Ian Hersey Ali, Glenn Lowry, Bridger Fettersy, Jim Rickards, Carl Benjamin, and so many more. Plus, we're about to interview some of the biggest guests in the world. We can't name them just yet, but trust me, they're huge. Metaphorically speaking, not just because they're American. Our Locals gives you access to a great community of like-minded people where you can share memes and make new and problematic friends. You also get early access to live shows and we're about to release details of our tour so you'll want to know about that as well. On the higher tiers, you get monthly supporter calls and the opportunity to have a meal or a call with us. Click the link below or go to trigonometry.locals Dot com and join the community. That's trigonometry.locals.com. We'll see you there. Hello, guys, and welcome back. Remember that you've still got a chance to send your super chat and your PayPal's through, and you'll be able to ask Constantine questions directly. 
Our first... Do we want them to buy the book, by the way? Oh, yes, and you want... That is a good point. Is it? Yeah, it is a good point. So if you buy... You can also buy the book. Links are in the description. And the links are in the description. So buy yourself a copy. Also available on Amazon and Kindle. And as an audio book as well. And Francis, I would say, like, obviously, I really appreciate everyone's already put the book and people sending super chats and all of that. The one thing I would ask is if you do plan to get the book, mm. get it now because any sale between now and Saturday gets registered for the uh, Sunday Times bestseller list. And I think I'm very close to being on it, if not already on it, but it's yeah. close. So uh, all the sales that happen in this week are, are like really, really important. And so if you're planning to get the book, or you're planning to get it for a friend or a family member, like now would be a great time from my perspective. But, you know, I, I appreciate everyone that's supporting us already. Absolutely. So get the book next month, guys. Now, now get it as soon as you can. So, but thank you, everybody, for watching. Go for it. We have got our first question. It's from Emmy Baker Lana. Ooh. And she says, I love Hi. a bit of EBL. What's well, she saying? Yeah, absolutely. So, so do we all. She says, Hi, Constantine. Now, you and your wife have become parents. How will you keep your love letter relevant to him, seeing that he's been born here and won't have had the experience you've both had in your own lives? Well, one of the things that I'm very keen on is that he spends a lot of time with our, our both, both our families mm. in Eastern Europe, my family in Armenia, and sees a different world. I know that, for example, you were born in this country, mm -hmm. but it was your experience of being in Venezuela and seeing that country that it sort of helped you understand the broader mm -hmm. context. So I, th I hope, I'm hopeful that, uh, I doubt Nikolai's children will, will have that perspective, but m my children, I think, will. Yep, great uh, first, uh, first answer. Uh, the, Eleanor Stansby asks, uh, what part of your book am I gonna cry at first? Hmm, I actually think the preface. Really? Yeah, I cry when I read the preface. There you go. Why? Because I put a lot of a lot of my a lot of my biggest fears into it, I suppose. Mm. And also, you know, I wrote it in a way that I think is is kind of quite um, emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and yeah, like I say, it, it, it's it's kind of. I hope it's not prophetic, but if it is, then we're all in for a rough time. Okay, Zoe Solanke asks. When writing the book, did it help you come to any new conclusions that you weren't aware of before? You know, one of the things that writing the book was really helpful is because I had the focus that I wanted, I wanted like a random person on the street to be able to pick it up. Mm. I didn't want it to be some sort of like culture warrior treat mm. treatise, you know what I mean? So I wanted it to be able to be read by people who had a different point of view to me mm. rather than just, you know, throwing red meat to the base, if you like. Mm. Uh, it forced me to really examine my arguments and to make sure that they, that I was making a good argument instead of just making fun of stupid people mm. who are on the other side of me. Do you know what I mean? Because that's very easy. Yeah. I really wanted to make what I thought was a good and persuasive argument that would win over somebody who was a neutral. Excellent answer. Uh, our next question is from Mr. Winter. Oh, great. He says, looks like he's got his big boy pants on today. Despite the fact that your pamphlet will fill Poundland faster than your headline is receding, <laughs> and despite my book published when I'm 25 is better, you've done well. So that was the first part. But then he wrote uh, a second part to it where he says, bigotry aside, well done, my friend. I wish you all the success a Decay and West can provide. My question is, can we stop the tide we stand against? I think we can. I really do think we can. And uh, that's why I wrote the book. If I didn't think we could, I wouldn't have bothered writing the book, to be honest. Mm. I wrote the book because I think we can. I actually feel that the pendulum is slowing. I don't know if it's swinging back yet. And I have to say, you know, as much as I'm concerned about making sure the pendulum slows and stops, I do worry about the overswing because for every revolution, the counter revolution is just as ugly. Mm -hmm. So. I suspect it's quite likely that five or ten years from now, you and I are sitting here talking about the evil right-wingers who, who've gone too far, which at least will be a more natural place for us to be. Yeah, exactly. Cause, Back know, to our roots. Yeah, because you're Jewish and I look Jewish, so... Exactly. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, of course. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned. We, we've got to make sure that in opposing some of the craziness of the left, 
we don't become crazy ourselves. That, I think that's really important. Absolutely. Richard the horse, uh, and what a great question from a horse, says, uh, what's one thing from another culture that you think the, w the West could learn from or should implement? Oh, there's no question. And you saw it when you came to Armenia. Mm. It's family. Mm. Large families connected through generations, cousins and brothers and sisters who truly love each other and spend lots of time together. We are becoming very atomized in the West. Mm. And I think Rakib Exxon made this point. He talked about how actually a lot of the ethnic minority communities in the UK do have that cohesion and family connection that we are losing. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. And I know that it's, it's you know, one of the most meaningful things in my life. Like, I love my life, mm. right? The way I love what we do here. Mm. I love the friendships that we've built with you and with Anton and with uh, other people. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm loving everything. I, lo I loved writing the book. I love the fact that it's not even out yet and thousands of people have kindly bought it and are gonna read it. Like, it's incredible. My life, you know, my wife and I have just had a baby. He's wonderful. Like, I love everything. But the fact that I live far from my family is the one thing that, you know, it's difficult. It's mm -hmm. genuinely difficult. And if there was one thing I could change about my life without losing all the good stuff, it would be that. Mm -hmm. And I do think that far too many people, particularly as families get smaller, as we move after we, you know, leave school or whatever, we're becoming very disconnected. The number of people who end up in a, in a, in a, in a home when they're elderly mm. troubles me very much. Mm. I, it's not how we should treat our family. Mm. It's not how we should treat our parents. I'm not judging anyone, f you know, for their individual circumstances. I'm just saying, at the level of society, the disconnect between different generations is not good, man. And I if there's one thing that we could pick up from more traditional cultures, it's it's the preserving the family. It's preserving the big family mm. over, over generations and over time. Um, that's to me that's really really important now of course you know i feel like what we have here is kind of a family mm -hmm. but it, it's not the same no you know it's not the same uh so yeah i think that's really important and the other thing you know what it is muslims are right about gambling mm. horrible vicious, awful awful vice no joke generally is amy vows uh who lovely lovely supporter of the show she asked was there a specific moment when you realized you love the Anglosphere, and do you have a favorite historical Anglo figure that you look up to? Mm, that's a good question. Favorite historical figure? I don't know. Uh, what I would say is I am really, really interested in the history of the American Revolution um, because this was a time when people came together and then they were forced to conceive a new society almost from scratch. Mm -hmm in very, very unusual, I would say unique circumstances, mm. really. And because of that, they were forced to think about the way a society should mm. be organized in a way that we in Europe really don't. We're sort of like, oh yeah, you know, everything's worked out. We don't really have to have these conversations. Mm. We can just sort of argue about the tax rate and, and you know, what, what a woman is and whatever, and that's it. Uh, so I'm really interested in that period. And there were a lot of figures who contributed a lot to, to the way we now think about things that, came, that come out of that period. Um, but in terms of uh, when I realized that I was very, I mean, love, love is, of course, in the title, but I, I really think of it more as gratitude, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I sort of feel that every day since, since I became an adult and was present to the difference between what we have here and what we have elsewhere, you know, and, and I try to, you know, we, we talked about it with Richard Grannon, I think it was, that we, every time we have a meal here, we say grace, even though none, none of us is mm -hmm. religious, because it just connects with that gratitude that I think is really important to have, particularly if you're as fortunate and as genuinely privileged as we all are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Cass 8228 with a very generous super chat. Thank you very much, Cass. And you said, Francis, the Jenga you, you were talking about is called deconstruction. Mm. It is a Marxist tactic, in brackets, postmodernist, that is meant to tear apart society, hence her name. It is meant to deconstruct society, so a Marxist equity regime can be installed. He's got no question. I think he's just making a point. But the, man, the man paid $100. Let him make his point. Yeah, exactly. So that is a point. Uh, cabeza del vacío, meaning the, the head of emptiness or empty head, whichever way you want to interpret it, says, if the West were to write you a letter back, what do you think it would say? 
And the second question is, what if it was written by Mr. Winton? <laughs> he would say something about Pretty Patel yeah. uh, on the second one. I don't know. You know, I might sound cheesy to some people, but I, I genuinely feel very grateful to be here, as mm. I think you know. Uh, and I would just hope that if the West were to write a letter back to me, it would, it would also appreciate that I've tried to make the best of my time mm. here and contribute to the society. And I feel that even doing the show, not to forget about it going on YouTube, just in terms of the fact that you and I have created something here that employs like, you know, probably the best part of a dozen people at this point, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that have a meaningful job that they love and enjoy contributing to. That to me, you know, that that's enough. You know, yeah. I, I hope that I, I'm contributing and I hope that, you know, I was very touched when Douglas said that he, uh, you know, I am. I express gratitude to the West and my appreciation for it. And w he said we're lucky to have him. Like that to me means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Kieran Joseph says, wondering if FF could. Oh, FFF. No, if KK could sign a copy in Edinburgh, I'll sign it as well, mate. Yeah, <laughs> two for one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If you come to the live show, I'll I'll come outside and definitely sign it for you. No problem. Perfect, Kieran. So there we go. Uh, we're going to look through... Um, We've got PayPal's as well, We, we? do have PayPal's. Uh, Gillian Colucci with a very Italian hey, hey. Hey, But This is not the raw, but we will do the eggs and then <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it says, I increasingly encounter people lacking the skills to form an argument. Uh, what modification can be made in social media space, spaces to help rebuild these skills and get back to proper human discourse? Mate, I don't think it's about social media. I think it's about education. If you're not taught to think as a, at an early age and think through arguments, I mean, would you agree with this as a, as a former teacher? Yeah, we're not taught how to argue. We're not. We're not. I, I actually, we started to introduce it at school. At school, like we did as a group of teachers in the last year mm. of primary school, and we taught our children to have discussions, to you know, to, to represent one side, to represent another side. Mm and to listen, but I don't think that goes on in a lot of schools, if I'm being honest. Well, you, one place that you would have noticed it going on a lot is when you came with me to Armenia, yeah. with my family. Yeah. It, th this is so much of where this all comes from, and it's about parenting. Yeah. In my family, there was a culture of discussing ideas mm. and debating things, and things sometimes getting heated, but no one crossing lines. No. It was just a conversation, which is what you and I often do, mm. Anton and uh, all of yeah. us, right? You have to educate children from a young age how to have these discussions. If you don't, you can't then be upset that they're not doing it. Oh, that I completely agree with you. So, uh, we've cracked through a lot of them, a lot of the old super chats. So, we have got one from Francois Grief. Francois Grief? He's from South Africa. He says, I'm not going to do the rest of it in an accent. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that for Raw. Uh, legal immigrants to Western countries are almost always overachievers. Musk is the best example. Yet legal immigrants must jump through hoops to get to, into America, Britain, Oz, etc. Liberals, on the other hand, and as a general rule, want to give illegal immigrants an easy entrance. Why do you think that is? And he says, and it says, by the way, it feels weird not being allowed to troll two top comedians. <laughs> uh, well. I think we've got to be careful. I, I don't think it's true that, you know, everyone on, on the sort of liberal left yeah. wants to make it easy for, for illegal immigrants to come here. But the reason they, those of them that do is, look, the right and left both have problems and they're different in nature. The right is yeah. sometimes too cold and clinical and analytical and lacks compassion where mm. sometimes necessary. The left's problem, which is to Francois's point, is they have too much heart and not enough head. Mm -hmm. And so they're well, like, well, I want everyone to have what we have, and uh, which, which is understandable, yeah. right? But they're not thinking about the practical consequences. No. I, th I think that's where they're coming from. And by the way, I, I'm in favor of allowing a certain small number of refugees who are properly vetted to come to this country. But I think illegal immigration is an abomination. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be happening. The fact that you've got people getting into boats and going over the... It, it, it just shouldn't be happening. Hmm. They're jumping the line. They're breaking the laws of this country. We don't know who they are. We haven't made sure... Look, Francis, I'm a Democrat. If the people of Britain vote to have an open border, I mean, I think that's an idiotic idea, but they're entitled to do that. And if the people of Britain vote for restrictive immigration policy, they're entitled to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have now is that the policy that was 
that the politicians keep talking about and running on when they stand for parliament and they stand to be prime minister is not what we're getting. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a big problem. Mm. It's a big problem that's storing up a lot of resentment for later. Oh, absolutely, because it puts a pressure on everything. It puts pressure on housing. It puts yeah. pressure on public services. No, but my point is something else, which is, forget about all that. Mm. It's whatever your view of, on immigration is, we're not getting what the people voted for. Of course. That's, to me, the biggest problem. Yeah. And then, of course, the other stuff, you know, it's yeah. a separate issue. So, this is from Karen. And she asked, do you think all the trivial social justice warrior shouting and bullying is being used to distract us from the real problems in the world that really matter? You know, keep the, the privileged in the West dumb and numb and therefore control the masses and take our freedoms away. Well, I think, I don't know whether there is like a global conspiracy to make that happen, but that mm. is definitely the consequence for sure. Yeah. That is absolutely what's happening, Karen. We are distracted, we are divided, and uh, you know, we're missing some important things that are going on in the world right now. We are, we're missing lots and lots of important things. So we've just got another one sent through. So here we go. Well, there was about five or six, mate. So Yeah, we, we've cracked through a lot of them and some of them. There, there was there was just trolling ah, from okay. bloody skies. Bloody skies, yeah. And, and a few others. Yeah, ban him. Ban him, ban him. So this is from Liam Poulos, or Pools. He says, do you think... <laughs> you foreigned up his name. Yeah, there, Poulos. I mean. uh, hey, he, Liam Poulos. Yeah, he's from South Africa. South Africa. Uh, do you think there is a correlation between increasing multiculturalism and increasing polarisation in a country? Can the American constitution cater for more for modern radical ideas mm. well two separate questions i don't want to comment about the american constitution because it's very much out of my wheelhouse but mm. in terms of multiculturalism i always try to make this and this is a really important distinction for answers between mm. a multi-ethnic society a society in which there are many people of different ethnicities mm. and a multicultural society a culture a society in which people are encouraged to retain the culture which they brought with them from a, a foreign country. Mm -hmm. a, a multi-ethnic society can work absolutely fine mm. as long as people have an overarching common identity that they can all unite behind. Mm. For example, we say we're all British or yeah. we're all American. But the moment you start making society multicultural, that is to say, well, look, if you've come here from Russia, you don't need to become British. You don't need to teach, learn the language. You don't need to integrate. No, you, you live with other Russians in a small ghetto, eat Russian food, speak Russian, don't learn the local language, etc., etc., etc. That's a problem. Mm. And we have pockets in this country, as we talked with Ed Hussein about, yeah. where there are certain communities that have integrated incredibly well. And there are certain other communities, often coming from the same geographical area, mm. who've become a world unto themselves, who are insulated, who, who have their backs turned upon the rest of society, who, who practice different customs, who want their own legal system. We can't have that. Mm -hmm. That is a recipe for disaster. Completely agree. Sven Helga Hachim. Uh, so there's people who are watching this who don't watch Raw who are just like, why, why are they doing that? Uh, he, and he asks, I still get blank stares when I use the term the West. Do you think we will be able to bring it back fully into common usage? I think so. I, I haven't encountered that problem particularly. But uh, as if you were here at the beginning, Sven, mm. I made the point that, of course, the book is called An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, but I was really talking specifically about the Anglosphere because I think mm. it's, it's different in the way that it does things to even the rest of the West. Mm. We don't want to associate with the French and the Germans. Oh, no, absolutely not, mate. And according uh, to our guest today, Peter Zehan, it's not looking good for the Germans. You're going to have to watch that episode. It is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Bloody Skies goes, Oi, what was wrong with my question? Uh, he says, there was no reference to, peg to pegging and what uh, anything else was... Uh, I just can't say it, Bloody Skies. Uh, so, uh, let's see what we have got left. I think that has got... Anton, is that it, everything? I, yeah, think that's pretty much, I think that's pretty much everything. We have run out of time guys thank you so much for joining in our plan is that we're going to be doing a lot more of these uh we're going to be d d constantly in our yeah, i'm going to write a book a month guys That's yeah what's exactly happening. we're we're going to be doing a lot more talking about uh the state of the world as we see it the challenges that we are all going to face thank you so much for tuning in to this very special episode our episodes normally go out on wednesday or Sunday. Francis, that's great. Do we want them to buy the book, though? Yes, 
I'm going to get to that in a second. Well, maybe they've all switched <laughs> off by now. Tell them to buy the fucking book. Buy the book. The link is in the comments. Unbelievable. It is a great read. An Immigrant's a Love Letter to the West. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. I have read it. We have all read it. We urge you to buy it. Dougie, it's a, Dougie loved it. Douglas Murray. He absolutely loved it. And the Sunday Times. And the Sunday Times. So and Peter Bogosian. And Peter Bogosian. And my mum. And your mum. And your dad. Actually, neither of them particularly read it or liked it. <laughs> but yes, so make sure to buy it. Thank you so much for watching us. Episodes always go out Wednesday and Sunday, 7 p.m. UK time. It's also available as a podcast. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for watching. And thank you if you're listening. Take care and we'll see you soon.